And, and we're talking about killing anger today. I actually had a couple of people come up to me and say, that sounds a little bit violent, using the word killing in your sermon name. But the reality is anger does kill. And if we don't kill it, it will kill us. Maybe not physically, but it will kill us in other ways. The last three weeks, we've been talking about the good life. It's an interesting message because everybody wants to have the good life. And when Jesus shows up on the scene, the last three weeks, we've been talking about these three topics. Number one, kingdom of heaven. The thing that we're waiting for is not far off. It's here. If we live out the principles that Jesus has taught us, like love and patience and forgiving our enemies and praying for those who persecute us, if we do those things, no matter how hard they are, a slice of heaven literally shows up on earth. Number two, we said that everybody makes the cut. Everybody, no matter who you are, rich or poor, male or female, a sinner or a saint, everybody, the definition of who gets to make it in if they have faith in Jesus is expanded to everybody. Whereas most of our lives, we've been told that only a few exclusive people make it to the top. Jesus is saying is everybody's making it. And then Jack preached last week about the importance of being salty. Who here has been salty this past week after Jack's sermon? Raise a hand. Who's been salty? One person's been salty back then. Give Anton a hand. Woo! Salty. Can we give you a nickname? Salty Anton? Yes, salty. Uh, My daughter and I actually roasted an entire chicken this week, and I got this recipe from my brother, and the recipe's really, really good. And you think, man, you must have loaded this thing up with so many ingredients. But the entire recipe has two ingredients, chicken and salt. Chicken and salt. And what you do is you heat up your oven to 450 degrees, heat up real good. You take the chicken and you take some big crystal salt, so sea salt or regular kosher salt will do, and you put salt all over the chicken, underneath, beyond it, behind it. You know, you flip it around, you rub all the salt into it, and then you put the chicken into the oven and you apply 450 degrees of heat for an hour or an hour and a half. And you know what happens afterwards? This raw, nasty, have you ever had raw chicken? Has anybody ever undercooked chicken at a barbecue and you're like, and it's raw? Nasty. This nasty piece of raw flesh, after heat, pressure, and salt, the salt goes in, caramelizes the chicken, and all of its good flavors just come out. It's tasty. Can't get enough of it. Grace was licking her finger, it's all over her face. The salt brought all the goodness out of the chicken. We as a church, that's what we're called to do. Chicken salters. Put that on your phone. Bring out the good in the world. You see, the world, there's good in it because when God created heavens and the earth in Genesis 1, we hear this phrase over and over in the Hebrew. He did this and this and that, created the heavens and the earth, and he called it tov, good. This is good. And it's been blemished, and it's been corrupted by evil and sin, but it's still there, and Jesus restores it, and he comes into the world of evil, and he doesn't repay evil for evil, and he voluntarily gives up his life, and he says if somebody hits you in the cheek turn the other side and he doesn't wish any damnation on his enemies he says father forgive them for they do not know what they do and all of a sudden jesus is bringing the saltiness the good out of this world this is what we're called to do and for many of us let's be honest we get onto this path of saltiness I've been on this path many times where I felt like the God of the heavens is in my heart, in my life. Emotionally, I'm doing really well. I'm going along. I'm chugging along. Everything's really great. But then at some point, something breaks and you lose saltiness. Have you ever felt that before? Losing the saltiness. I've lost my saltiness many of times. And the reality is, Jack preached about it last week, if salt loses its saltiness, it's thrown out and it's trampled on. A lot of times we think when people persecute us or they don't like Christians, we say, man, we're being persecuted. The reality is maybe we've lost our saltiness and people are trampling on us because we make no sense. The reality is maybe we've lost love and we show hate. The reality is maybe we just scream our talking points instead of living them out And people are trampling on us and we're saying we're losing all of our Christian rights and all this sort of stuff. Well, maybe we've just lost our saltiness. And the rest of the Sermon on the Mount is not 
a theological poetry sort of thing about here's how great God is. The rest of the Sermon on the Mount is very practical. And the rest of it basically says this, you are to be very careful because if you do these things, if you get away from Jesus and you allow anger to fill your heart, you're going to lose all of your saltiness. I remember when I was born again, I was such a great Christian. I was on fire for God. I started to give to the poor. I was being more patient at work. I started volunteering at a homeless shelter. You know, some of us will adopt a puppy and serve as a chair of our neighborhood council. And we start recycling and bringing paper cups to save the environment. And everything is going great. And you think you're an angel for God. And then it's just this aura comes from you like, God has saved me. And you think nothing can take Jesus away. And then you get home and your business partner calls and says, hey, We're going to go look at a real estate building for our business expansion. The architect is asking you to bring layouts, print them out on big sheets of paper so we can doodle. So you go home to your office and you plug in your computer and all of a sudden you look at your watch and figure out, oh my goodness, I'm running late. I have to get these printed five minutes ago. So you hook it up, you open the file, you hit print. And as you're waiting for it to print, you get an error message on the printer. Error, ink cartridge is empty. And you go, wait, I changed it yesterday. So you pull it out and you pull it back in and it says, ink cartridge is bad. You're like, no, I brought the one from Amazon for this printer. What is going on? And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you feel like your heart starts to race. It goes, your face gets red. Your ears get red. You start hitting the printer and kicking the table. And you take it and your life turns into a scene from office space as you're throwing the printer. Next slide. And you're trying to hit it as hard as you can, because it's not working. And you're cursing HP and their Indian call centers for putting you on hold for four hours. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, your entire Jesus life evaporated. Why? Because of anger. Anger sucks all the oxygen out of the room. You could be doing well for years, and then just one point, you just... You go crazy because you get angry. And all of a sudden, there is no room for compassion or reason or logic or puppies or homeless shelter or loving your neighbor or being kind. Out of an irrational rage, we turn into baseball-carrying, wielding people, if not in physical reality, at least on the inside. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Don't talk to those people after church. (laughs) You just outed yourselves as angry people. But this is a reality that happens, and Jesus knows this. And what happens in the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus starts to attack chronologically the things. The most important thing he attacks is anger. Then he's going to attack lust. And he's like, man, if you can get rid of anger and lust, those two things, man, 95% of your problems will be out the door. Because he knows that our enemy wants to get us, and the easiest way to get it is with anger. So Jesus is speaking to his followers, and he utters these words in the Sermon on the Mount, which shocks his listeners. He says this, You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. This is a little bit unfair, Jesus, okay? I don't kill anybody, fine, but anger, really? Are you serious? You're going to equate anger with murder. That doesn't seem very fair. And what Jesus is actually doing here is he's raising the bar by diving deep into the problem. He's raising the bar by diving deep into the problem. He's taking anger as an onion, murder as an onion, and he's saying, yes, the outer layer could be murder, but before you even get there, there are a lot of other little layers that lead up to that. And it doesn't matter if you don't physically kill somebody, if you allow even the same poison that gets you to murder at some point to be inside of you, you might not physically kill somebody, but you will relationally kill them. Or your joy will be killed or your happiness will be killed, or your love for Jesus will be killed. You don't have to physically murder to have death in your life because anger is a poison no matter how small or no matter how large, whether it's murder or whether it's holding it too long against somebody you love, that will destroy your joy. And if you don't get it, it will get you. It's a poison, so get rid of it. And Jesus is bringing this up. Here's the reality. Most people can go throughout life and not kill anybody. Most people can. The percentage of the population that actually physically murders somebody is pretty low, and we make documentaries on Netflix about them. 
The rest of the population engages in anger to various degrees and def- various levels, uh, and that's it. And so Jesus attacks it at its source. This is the beautiful thing about Jesus. He's saying, let me get to the source of the problem. How many of you have ever thought the ra- rage or the anger that I've had is justifiable? It's right. Isn't there room for good, righteous anger? The question is asked. And the reality is, yes, there is. Not all anger is bad. In fact, anger is literally a function of the human will. Because you are created in the image of God, because I am created in the image of God, we have free will. And as we navigate this world, if our free will gets violated, our first response is anger. It's a survival instinct. And sometimes it's totally okay. Sometimes you get angry because somebody is cutting you off in traffic, or sometimes you get angry because somebody is threatening your life, and it's one of those responses in your body. It's for survival. So getting angry itself isn't bad necessarily, but it's what you do with the anger and how you process the anger that will rule your life. And a lot of us have really bad anger processors, really bad anger processes. There's this story in the New Testament where Jesus, he's becoming very famous. He's healing people. He's opening the eyes of the blind. And he's doing all this stuff. And the religious Pharisees and leaders of the day, they get very jealous because he's more famous than they are. And they were holding on to these archaic old systems like the Sabbath. They were saying that basically means you can't do any good on the Sabbath. Instead of taking it for what it really meant, which is you're supposed to rest and focus on God on the Sabbath. And so Jesus is in the center of this crowd, and they bring a man who has a withered hand, who cannot use his hand, and it's the Sabbath. And so the religious leaders are looking specifically to see if Jesus would violate the technicalities of the law and do some work on the Sabbath, even though the work was to heal somebody. And Jesus turns it on them, and he says this, is it proper, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And of course, the right answer is yes. Who would not want a man who has a withered hand not be healed? Nobody, but because in their head, they're angry, not on the miracle. They're not mad that Jesus can perform a miracle. They're mad that Jesus is more popular than they are. They're angry, but their anger, the source of it is jealousy. The source of it is selfishness. The source of it is their power hungry. And instead of saying yes or no, because they're also politicians, if they say, of course it's a sin, the crowd is going to get mad at them and they still need their votes, they stay silent. They don't say anything. So there's a brother with a withered hand and the people, the leaders are staying silent because they don't care about him. They care more about themselves than they care about this person. And Jesus gets angry. Look at Jesus' anger here in Mark 3, 5. He looked around at them with anger. We don't like to say Jesus is angry. We like to say Jesus is full of love and he just forgives us, but he's angry. And he's grieved at the hardness of their hearts. So he's mad at their situation. Get this. And he said to the men, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and his hand was restored. Jesus was angry Because he saw an injustice and a failure in the world and he wanted to fix it and something stood in the way of God's goodness. If there's something in the way of you reaching God's goodness in your life, be angry at that thing. If your addiction to pornography or drugs keeps you from the Lord, be angry at that thing. Grieve over that thing. Come to Jesus with that thing. If your ego causes you to make fun or belittle your wife or your husband or your mother or your father because you're prideful. Be mad at that thing. It's okay to be angry at that thing. Jesus and God himself are angry and love at the same time. This sounds like an oxymoron, but let me put it to you this way. Jesus's and God's anger and his love are two sides of the same coin. It is because he loves us so much that he's angry at the sin that destroys our relationship with him. It is because he loves us so much that he will walk with us 
and he will give us temptations and trials sometimes and walk with us through that to get rid of the things that keep us from him. It is because he loves us so much that he allowed the anger and wrath of humanity to be bestowed upon his son, Jesus Christ, for us to see, receive salvation and eternal life. This is a God who loves, and his anger is used to help people, not destroy people. And this is the question for us. Jesus' anger didn't hurt anybody. It helped somebody. If you ever want to test, is my anger righteous? Is this a good anger or a bad anger? Ask yourself this. If I follow through on the things, the, the, the realities of my anger, if I follow through on my anger, will it help somebody or will it hurt somebody? Will it help somebody or will it hurt somebody? Am I mad at my wife because I want to help her be a better Jesus follower? Or am I mad at her because I grew up in a Slavic world where my mom cooked for me and I'm 32 and I can't pick up a recipe book and cook something because she's pregnant? Get over yourself. Cook yourself some eggs. What are you angry about? Is it because your pride is hurt? Because you're a man or a woman or whatever definition? Or because there's injustice in the world? If you're angry that so many kids are living without parents, the proper anger response would be to go adopt somebody out of the foster care system. If you're angry at the poverty problem, the, the result would be let's hire somebody or train them, not let's say you're just a horrible person who won't pull yourself up by your bootstraps. So test your anger. And what I love about the Bible and what I love about Scripture, we never hear a command from Jesus that says don't ever get angry. We don't see that in scripture. What we see is this in Proverbs 19. Good sense makes one slow to anger. And it is his glory to overlook an offense. And Ephesians 4.26 says this. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Sometimes you're angry because your will was violated. Somebody cut you off. The worst thing that you can do is respond immediately out of anger. Because usually the response is this like crazy force for force, proportionate or even higher than what you've just experienced. And what can lead to is it can lead to a lot of car accidents or something stupid. Ambrose Bierce, a 19 or 1800s poet said this, speak when you are angry and it will make the best speech you will ever regret. Stay calm. Here's the thing that the Bible says. When you get angry, let those emotions go over you, but pause. Don't respond. Think about it for a second. What will I do? Will my response hurt somebody or will it help somebody? I saw a meme on Facebook that perfectly captured this sentiment. It said this, I may look calm, but in my head, I've punched you in the face three times already. <laughs> the reality is that can happen to us sometimes. And God says, look, you're not going to sin if those thoughts hit your mind. Like, I'm not saying you're perfect. Sometimes that will happen. It's what you do afterwards. And Jesus wants us to be careful. I'll tell you the truth, I, as your pastor, have not been perfect in this world. I think I'm this calm, helping, loving pastor. One day, years ago, I got a phone call from this gentleman who was very angry at me for some reason. I won't give you too many details because I don't want you to think it's about you if you call it. No, the person's not here. And they were mad about something, the way I dealt something, and, and they, they said something to the effect of, they were obviously either drunk or something on the phone, and they said, I'm going to come over to your house and kill you and your family or something like that. And immediately this anger took over me. I got so red hot. I said, you come here, you die. <laughs> And you know what he said? How can you say that you're a pastor? <laughs> and then I come upstairs and Julia's hiding under the counter. Who was that? <laughs> I've never seen you so mad in your life. I said, I told them I have guns, but I don't really have any. I lied and I was angry. But they threatened you. I love you so much. It was this flight or fight response. I was just like, uh, I don't care. You come to my property? Mm. Thought about it for a while. Thought about it for a while. I think that was righteous anger. I'm good with it. <laughs> but we have those moments. But let's be, let's be honest. Not everything is like that example. Most of the time when we get angry, it isn't because somebody's threatened to kill us. I know this person. They're not really going to kill me. They were just 
high on weed or something. Most of the time, it's stupid things. Have you ever been in a fight with somebody, let's say your wife or your husband or your parents, and you were fighting for so long over something so stupid, like you didn't take out the trash or you didn't water the lawn in time, and then three weeks later, you're still fighting, but you don't even remember what you're fighting about. We've been there, right? It's so stupid. We have these examples where people get together for Thanksgiving, and for 20 years, the son and the father haven't talked. Why? Anger. And they let it fester. Over what? Over nothing. It's stupid. And it has killed their relationship. And in that environment, it's really hard to live a life that glorifies God. And it's not so much about you doing the wrong thing. God is not saying like, oh, I'm going to punish you for being angry. He's like, look at the results of your own life. Your life is poisonous. It's not fun to live in a relationship like that. So you're hurting yourself. I know when I was early on in our marriage, and we've been married for almost 11 years now, but I remember all the time in the very beginning, because we didn't get a lot of marriage counseling, we'd fight over stupid stuff. And I remember to this day, one day I was driving home, and I was probably two miles away from the house, and I was thinking about how do I respond to this thing that I'm upset about with my wife, Julia. And it was very apparent to me there are two pathways here. One pathway is I can bring up what I'm mad about, and what that will cause is an equal response, and then we'll be in a conflict for a week or maybe even more, that's one way. Another way was very apparent to me that if I just suck it up, buttercup, and take a hit to my ego and just forgive about it and forget about it because it's not a big deal, we would have a great weekend. We'd have a weekend full of joy and laughter. And in my 11 years of marriage, I've gone down both of those paths. And let me tell you, the time I've walked down the self-righteous pathway, it's never worth it. It's never good. It's always stupid. It's always a drain and a waste of time. Dallas Willard says this, that the problem is, if you walk down this pathway of choosing to be angry at people over stupid things, and there are a lot of stupid things out there, so there's a lot of opportunities for this, what will inevitably happen, and this is the scary part, this is the scary part, inevitably what happens is sometimes it feels so good to be offended that a self-righteousness builds up in your heart and you like being a victim and you indulge in anger and it piles up. And here's what Dallas Willard says. He says, you get addicted to the feeling of being angry and it's like an adrenaline rush that you can't live without. That is deep. That's not physical murder, but let me tell you, you are a murder machine walking around. Everything in your pathway is going to burn because you're this person that likes to be offended over everything. It's a cancer. We've been around those people. Don't raise your hand if you're one of those, but we've been around those people in our families that everything's a rainy day for them, that all the world is against them, that everything's not their fault. It's all your fault. And we get into this system where our life is just not fun. We're walking on eggshells. And this is what Proverbs 22, 24 says about that. Make no friendship with a man given to anger, nor go with a wrathful man. The reality is you can become that person that people don't want to be around. Are you that person that people have to walk around eggshells around you? Don't be that person and don't let anger build up because if you build it up, it will turn into this self-righteous indulgence fest where you're always looking for reasons to be mad. It's not a fun life. An elderly couple who fought most of their life were sitting on the couch and the gentleman who was probably in his 80s turned to his wife and he said, honey, you know, I'm a very wrathful and angry man and I'm just so impressed by how over the years you've always responded with calm and peace and patience. Thank you. How do you do it? And she said, well, it's actually quite easy. Every time you got angry and you were mad at me, I just went and cleaned the bathroom. I said, really? How did that help? I used your toothbrush. <laughs> <laughs> One day my wife and I went to get breakfast. Well, went. We, we got breakfast at our house. I was making eggs, and I remember in the middle of this process, the kitchen stank really bad. It smelled like a dead cat. And so we looked for, where is this coming from? Maybe we left a banana peel under the refrigerator. Maybe there's something rotting in one of the cupboards that we left some fresh vegetables that gone bad. We looked everywhere. We couldn't do it. And I remember sitting down having breakfast that day, and we're eating the eggs, and we're drinking the coffee. And here's the interesting part. The eggs, though themselves were good, I couldn't eat them. I did not enjoy them because of the stink in the room. The coffee, which I'm a coffee lover. I'll drink anything that's coffee. 
I couldn't enjoy it. I didn't understand what is going on. And we found out later after breakfast that the night before when we had fish, because we're Slavic, uh, we threw the fish into the trash can and we piled other stuff on top. And that whole trash can stunk up the house. And because we were too lazy to take out the trash the night before, our entire world became a trash can that morning. That's what happens when we don't resolve anger daily. When we leave it and we let it fester, your life can become a trash can. Your relationships, your family gatherings can be a trash can. You might not want to see your relatives. You might not want to see your life because anger takes over completely. Dallas Willard puts it like this. Our mental and emotional resources are marshaled to nurture and tend to anger. There's a slide for this. Our body throbs with it. Energy is dedicated, dedicated to keeping it alive. We constantly remind ourselves of how wrongly we have been treated. So takeaway number one for today is simply this. Take out the trash anger daily. Take it out daily. Don't let the sun go down without you figuring out. I know sometimes that's hard for relationships that have festered for a while, but at least start thinking through what's the best way for me to reduce some of these trash levels into my life because if I don't, something worse is going to happen. Something worse is going to happen. And Jesus continues his teaching and he says this, whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. Now, in the Greek or in other translations, that insult to the brother is actually raka. Race, auto spell, sorry. Raka, R-A-C-A. To anybody who says to his brother, raka will be liable to the council, which was their version of the Supreme Court. And what Jesus is saying is this. If you don't take care of anger daily, it's going to build up, and over time, it's going to transform. It's going to evolve into the next worst thing. And the next worst thing past anger is contempt. Contempt is saying something like, I'm mad at you and I don't care about you anymore. Where anger is like, I care about you, you're special, so I'm going to be mad at you, hopefully because that's going to cause damage in your relationship with me and you'll want to win me back. It never works, by the way, but that's what we do. Contempt is even worse. I don't even care about you anymore. I'm going to move on from you. I'm done with you. The best illustration of the difference between anger and contempt comes from the 1990s classic Home Alone. There is this scene where Kevin McAllister starts a fuss at a family party, and he's walking, and his mom's like, I'm going to ground you. And so she sends him upstairs into the attic, and she says this, I don't want to see you for the rest of the night. That's anger. That's, I want to see you tomorrow, but right now I'm just fed up with you. Kevin McAllister takes it to the next level. He has contempt, and he says, I don't want to see you ever again for the rest of my life. I hope you die. I hope I wake up, and I have no family. And this is what happens if we don't take care of anger. It stores up like a gas tank, and when it overspills, it turns into contempt. And then not only do we not like our people, we hate our people. And if you're married or if you're in a family, that's a horrible place to be because you share a roof. In Hebrew, the word raka, the closest thing that translators could come up with is it's the sound that is made when you collect spittle from the bottom of your throat to spit. That harking sound. Guess what? When you spit on something, what you're saying is this has no value, right? Have you ever accidentally spit? Like you're opening the door to your car and you spit and somebody's walking by and it hits their shoe. <laughs> I'm so sorry. You didn't mean to do that. Spitting is a very big insult. In, in the Russian language, there's a phrase for it that's very popular. To just spit on you. It basically means I could care less about you. If we let anger fester, it turns into content. And then it moves into even a worst phase. It goes from anger to content to phase three. It's hate. Hate. Then we start to hate people. It's manifested in name calling. So Jesus says, anyone who says you fool is in danger of hell. Why so serious, Jesus? Because the closest translation of the word fool in the original Hebrew would mean to call somebody and say, well, you're the son or daughter of uh, parents that weren't married. Essentially, you're a bastard child. The most direct translation of fool is you stupid bastard. And he actually goes deeper. You could put all your sorts of swear words into it. So you go from I'm angry at you to I don't care about you to I think you're a fool 
And I don't even think you're worthy the image of God that was stamped upon you during birth. Genesis 1, man created in his image. You're saying, I deny you the image of God that you were born with, and not only are you valueless, you're worthless. And guess what? The line between that and murder is really close. But it's still part of this system that's all tied together. And so what Jesus is saying, it doesn't matter if you're in phase one or phase two or phase three. It's all the same trash. It's all the same trash. And maybe you won't be the 1% of the population that gets here, but your life will be a living hell. Your relationships will be a living hell. You maybe have not killed somebody physically, but functionally they are dead to you. You cannot love these people. The scary thing is a lot of us have functionally dead people in our lives because we've let anger fester for years. Takeaway two is this, anger kills the best in life. Job 5.2 says, for anger slays the foolish man and jealousy kills the simple. Jesus ends this section with another illustration. And what this illustration does is simply say this to all of us. If you have these problems, do not wait. Do not wait for tomorrow. Fix them today. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly, I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Jesus is saying anger is so poisonous that you have to move fast to get rid of it. It's like a cancer. Last year, two of my family members had cancer. And I remember sitting in that room and a cancer doctor walking out and saying, excuse me, this is what you have to do to get rid of cancer. And I remember my dad and my mom, they had plans for that year. They wanted to sell their house and do all of these things. Well, guess what? All of that went on the back burner. They didn't go, let us sell our house first and then fight this thing. No, it was, this gets priority over everything, everything else. Everything else can wait. And Jesus is saying anger is so bad, it's so poisonous that everything else can wait, even if you're at the altar giving a sacrifice. Meaning if you're sitting in this room right now and you have a relationship that is broken, this is the only time ever in the history of our church that I let you to get up and leave during my sermon. Go take care of it now. Here's the problem that Jesus is underlying. The Jewish people, the most sacred thing to them possible was to be in the temple giving a sacrifice. And they were doing that while at the same time they had anger in their life. So guess what they did? Here's what they did. They said to sweep anger under the rug, we're going to create this religious system and we're going to be faithful to it. Church, here's the scary thing. Sometimes we create our religious activities to mask our anger and our inability to follow Jesus because it's easier to come on a Sunday and raise your hands in worship then go home and raise the same hands in a fist and yell at your spouse or your child because nobody sees your home life. The same hands do this, they go home, they do this. And what Jesus is saying, I like worship, but if you're doing this, stop this and go take care of this first and then you can come back. Religious activity, religious prominence is less important Church going and all the stuff we do to look holy is less important than relationship with people. Just stop with the religious facade, Jesus says. I don't need your facade. Yeah, it's nice when you do it, but at the end of the day, the relationship between you and people reflects your relationship with God. And we have created as a church too many avenues where people can fake it. We've created too many avenues where people mostly come to church on Sunday, but they won't go to a small group because their real life is exposed there. And so by going to church on Sunday and giving the tithe, we give them a pass and we say, great, great for you. We do that, I do that. And he says, if somebody's taking you to court, try to cut a deal with them. That's another example of this sense of urgency. So church, here's a challenge for today. Don't wait. If you've been fighting in your marriage, go home today, scrap your plans and talk to your spouse. Figure it out. 
Don't let your ego get in the way. Take out the trash today. If you have parents or a boss or an employee, or if you remember that you hurt somebody from the church, don't wait. Have the conversation today, May 26th of 2019. Let this be the day where you've removed some of that poison because if you do, you'll see that you'll have more room for Jesus in your life, that you will have more room for following God in your life. If you get angry moving forward, get angry, but pause. Don't you know, shout your anger Just pause and think about it and pray to God and say, Lord, help me process this. And if it's righteous anger, good for you. Protect your family. Do what's needed. If it's selfish anger and it's going to hurt people, ask the Lord to help you resolve it. And if you're not close with the Lord, call me or call your brother or your sister or somebody that you trust. Takeaway three is this. Make peace where possible today. Don't wait. Don't wait. Here's the reality. People of the Old Testament, in Jesus' time, they hid behind the law. They said, I don't steal. I don't murder. I don't sleep with my neighbor's wife. I'm good. And Jesus is saying, no, no, no. Because if you're angry or if you have lust or if you don't steal but you use a torrent site through a VPN address, same thing. Here's why this is bad. You know why this is bad? You've heard this conversation. People say, well, I'm not that bad of a person, right? I don't do these big things. The reality is people like this lifestyle because in these big things, you don't need God. I don't steal, I don't drink, I don't need God. But if you take your standard where Jesus took it and said if you get angry or you have lust in your heart, it's the same thing, then all of a sudden you need Jesus really bad to help you get through your life. And most of us have chosen I cannot do the big things and don't need God because then I can do whatever else I want during my free time. And not a lot lot of us have chosen, I really need Jesus to allow the kingdom of God to penetrate and be in my life. So we hide behind religion, good morals, and technicalities. I technically didn't sin. Do you need Jesus? I do. Our relationship with Jesus uncovers our technicalities and brings us out into a life that is good. A life that is deeper, more rich, more meaningful than the system of religion that we have created to save face. As we close today, I just wanted to say this, and this is a question. The Sermon on the Mount basically asks this fundamental question. Do you have Jesus or do you have religion? Do you have a system like going to church on Sunday that lets you get away or are you really living and leaning into the scripture and trying to live the life that Jesus asked us to live? That is the definition of being a disciple. I pray for myself that I'm the one who chooses Jesus over religion and I pray that you too choose Jesus over religion. And I'm not saying don't ever come to church. I'm saying use that as a way to Give yourself more energy, but let's not hide. Let's take out the trash this week. Let's come back next week rejuvenated because we've invited Jesus into our lives. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Jesus, we thank you that I go all the way to the source of the problem, that you don't just mince words, that you remind us that anger kept and stored evolves into contempt and hate and that it kills everything good in our life. And so today, let I just pray for myself and for my church, for our people here at Pacific Keep, that today you break those bondages of anger that are laid so strong in our lives with our spouses, with our wives, with our husbands, with our fathers and mothers, with our kids, with our relatives, with our neighbors, with our coworkers, all the little things that we store up because we're just full of an ego, God, we ask that you soften our hearts. We also pray for wisdom to have good, righteous anger when we see injustice in the world. And we pray that you turn us into a people that not only talks about what's wrong with the world, but we step up when we do something about it by helping other people, that we stand against injustice, that we stand against the broken shalom that we see all around us. Turn us into a people that loves you more than what we we love our religion and our systems, God. 
I pray a blessing over our congregation. I pray your Holy Spirit to be with us throughout the entire week. Soften our hearts and help us be peacemakers and vessels of your kingdom that's already here. We pray this all in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. This tree